Okay, we start recording. Hello, everybody. I hope uh, that other half of the of the Boulder people will join us, and I hope you downloaded uh, the Jupyter notebook and the FITS file that we need to work with this. Uh, so let me just uh, very quickly minimize this thing here so that we see everything. So let's run really quickly to my, through my previous presentation just to put some things in context about what are we going to do today. Uh, and I apologize for sitting, but you at least you see my place on your, on your screens, people who are remotely connected. Um, so we talked about the polarization. We have seen, we have basically understood this gift here. We have understood why the electric field rotates, why the electric vector rotates, what are the oper operational um, definitions of the Stokes parameters. And then we said at one point that basically what we measure in a way, so first of all, that every uh, ideal harmonic monochromatic plane wave is always 100% polarized. So I squared is always Q squared plus U squared plus V squared. You will see now when we look at some synthetic, and synthetic means calculated from simulations data, you will see that it definitely this is not true. And this is not true because what we actually always measure is uh, the incoherent superposition of many different wave packets. And I said that maybe the easiest way to think about it is that you think about wave packets that have certain duration, and that duration is much shorter than your integration time, right? So no interference can happen there. You can't simply measure on such, such small scales and things never overlap so much. So in a way what we, or, or another way to think about it is that you see photons which have all various states of polarization and they're all mixed and then if you have access of, for example, left-hand polarized photons or right-hand polarized photons or linearly polarized photons along this or this axis, the things are going to be, the, your, your ray is going to be polarized. And then the question was how to actually calculate, how to actually measure a Stokes vector in your, uh, in your instrument. And that's where we talked uh, about these things here. And then I said, okay, let's, Let's talk about the most simple way to do these things. And the most simple thing to do this way to things is to have one linear polarizer that is uh, that you can rotate and put in various or orientations, right? And then the transformation of your EX and EY is going to look something like this. And then another element that you need is a retarder, where basically you have EX being uh, transmitted without anything happening, EY having some access phase, phase log here, which we denote with delta. In practice, of course, this is not really how these elements work. It's both things are, are you have some phase shift. It's just that the phase shift along one axis is bigger than along the other axis. And usually, in this case, we would call Y the slow axis and X the fast axis. Okay, because phase lag is introduced into, into EY. And then the important equation was this one. So if you set arbitrary values for these angles theta and delta, okay, actually, uh, del yeah, but theta and delta in a way that you think about, uh, about uh, retardance as an angle, uh, then you can calculate the intensity of the, you can basically calculate the measurement, and this is what you're gonna, gonna measure here. You will see that in the exercise, we're going to erase this one half here. Okay. And this is very ideal and very, you know, uh, in principle, if we could arbitrarily change our angular orientation and our retardance any way we want, we could do this thing here. Of course, the problem is that to arbitrarily change the retardance of some, of some uh, uh, you know, uh, component, it's very hard. Maybe it's not very hard, but it's probably very hard to calibrate. So we should probably ask Francisco and his back what are exactly the, the nuisances here. But in principle, we could have a fixed, what, what we are going to do in the exercise is we're going to have a fixed retarder with fixed delta equals to pi half. And we're going to just put it in our beam and remove it from our beam. So we're either going to have retardance of pi half or we're not going to have any. Right? And uh, in principle, it's clear to all of you that in order to decipher the values of i, q, u, and v, the original ones that are arriving to your, uh, to your instrument, what you need to do is you need to make four different measurements here. 
So you need to have four different combinations. Of course, data and data don't always have to change here, but you have to have four unique combinations. And not any four unique combinations will do. So what we'll try to do is we'll try to guess the first combination, and we'll play with it a little bit, like a toy example, and then we will use the other scheme, which actually uses six measurements, and this is the one that Valentin was telling you about, and the one that is, once you're a little bit accustomed to polarimetry, makes the, more, the most sense because you're sort of measuring more or less uniquely I, Q, U, and V. Okay, so you have two measurements to determine I and Q, two measurements to determine I and U, two measurements to determine I and V, and so on and so on. I'm sorry that Valentin's slides are still not online. I forgot to ask for them, but he was also busy, so he just sent them to date. So I will post them after this lecture so that after all this is done, you can go through this talk and through Valentin's lecture, and then finally through the hands-on exercise, and then hopefully everything will make sense. Uh, can somebody tell me why we are only looking at the intensity here? What's the catch? Right? So I'm, so I'm putting some optical elements in the path of my polarized ray, and then in the end I'm only measuring the intensity. What's the catch with that? Do you understand what I'm asking? No. Like we have a Mueller matrix, you remember Mueller matrices? And let's say that this linear polarizer has some Mueller matrix. I apply this Mueller matrix to a Stokes vector, and what comes out is also a Stokes vector. Okay? Right? It has four components. And I'm only interested in I. Why is that? Because detectors can only measure I. Because the detectors can only measure I, exactly. So we don't have the detectors that are inherently sensitive to the polarization. And that is exactly the reason why we need the modulation. So one way of to, to, to think about modulation is you are twisting and modifying your signal in order to always extract one measurable quantity and then invert and go back. And also we're going to use this exercise to sort of uh, strengthen some concepts of about some other things like the noise and the number of photons and number of counts and how the size of the telescope influences and so on and so on. Okay, pretty cool. So let's get started from the very start. I gave you, I gave you the script so that in case you don't want to code in the real time and play with this in the real time, you can use the script. And of course, I will revert to it when, uh, when I fail and don't doubt that I will fail at some point. But I want us really to go very slowly, step by step, and people who who have these things very clearly and understand everything, you can run in, uh, you can run in front, and you can do your own things, and and so on and so on. So what am I gonna do here? Is I'm gonna go to where are we here? Okay, <clears throat> cool. So we are gonna open a new Jupyter notebook. We're Notebook. So there is one which I need to say new by three. And here we are. I think this is big enough so that we can see. Right. So what we need to do is we'll need our good old Fits, fit, way, way to read fits, we will need something uh, to plot things. We will need NumPy, and we will import other things as we, as we need them, but in principle, this thing should be enough to do everything that we want, right? So, let's first load the file and take a look at this cube. So, this cube that I prepared for you today comes from a small simulation. What I took is I, I took the simulation and then I basically calculated what would the emergent spectra of some spectral lines be. We will talk in the second part of, the, of our course a bit how this process works. Some of you already know this because you, you attended college course last time. And let me just disable my social media here and then we can we can start. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna open first the fits file and see what's what's in there. So the fits file depends where you where you put it in your in your uh, uh, 
uh, where you put it on your computer. So for me, it's in this folder here. So we are gonna do that. And the name is this one here. No, sorry. It's this one here. 63.0, synth. Let's see if that works. That works. Cool. Let's inspect our base file. Run that. So we see that we have two arrays here. One has dimensions one. So actually, this will be transposed when we when we retrieve it. So it will be 288, 288, 4, 131. And in the same way as it was the Hinode cube that we played with at the beginning of the course, these are x, y directions. 4 is for 4 Stokes parameters. So we finally understand where this 4 comes from. And 131 is for, for lambda, for the wavelength coordinate. And you have the wavelength grid specified here in a in a separate format. So if I was really, if I were a really, really serious guy, what I would do is I would also make you a header file which writes all these things so I don't have to say them. But of course, I, I didn't do that. So let's retrieve things. Let's say that Stokes is data zero data. And Valent, I will call it, uh, usually I call it, in the other file I call it Valent, I, but I usually call it LL. So let's use LL is data one data. Okay, and then if we print LL, you will see that these are some valence that correspond to roughly 6,300 Armstrongs, which are the valence that correspond to exactly to the same you know, the lines that we saw observed. And we will understand in a couple of weeks why specifically these lines are very interesting and why if you want to study the photosphere with Dickies, you will probably look at these lines or some, some similar ones. So, we basically, you probably already have a feeling how the data looks like. Uh, so let's just plot one example spectra just to see the units that we have this, this spectra given. So keep in mind that this is calculated from a simulation. So the units that we have here will be some physical units. Okay, they will be somehow in, in, in some system. So, so let's have a look how it looks like. So what I'm gonna do is, and we will use this a few times, so I'll just write it. Uh, I'll just write it, I'll take, take some time to write this down. So I will define these two quantities, which will pick the pixel for us that we want. So let's use, for example, what's the day today? Uh, 18th of February, so let's say 18, and Y coordinate is, well, let's say 202, for example. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plot a figure, with a given size, let's say 10 times seven. And then I'm gonna plot in four subplots, I'm gonna plot, um, be a plot, wavelength versus given spectra. So spectra is gonna be what? So it's gonna be, uh, because this is a 4D cube, I want to take specific, I want to cut specific pixel and specific uh, Stokes parameters, so it's going to look something like like this. Um, let's say zero, and this is going to be first Stokes parameter, and then we just repeat this two, three, four times. We change a few numbers, and this is going to be one, two, three. Let's see if this works. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, we didn't. Okay. What don't you like? Okay, here they are. Cool. So here are some Stokes spectra. Okay, and the units here are some units. So now, if you were just to look at this, and somebody told you this comes from the simulation, you would have to be quite experienced to really know what these units are. So in principle, you should ask the person, "Hey." Friend, what are these units here? And in this case, we know this is specific intensity that we got familiar with at the, at the beginning. So specific intensity is energy per unit surface, per unit time, per unit solid angle, per unit wavelength, right? So in this context, these are CGS units, which means that energy is in perg, surface is in centimeter, 
wavelength is in centimeter and okay, angle is always in steradians. So what I want us to do now is I want us to convert this in counts using the KIST specifications, okay? So you know how big the telescope is, you know the distance to the telescope, from the, uh, the sun to the telescope, and I'm gonna tell you now that the size of the pixel is 20 kilometers. And from the wavelength grid, you can see what's the wavelength sampling. So what I'm gonna do now, and I propose you do the same, try without looking at the other code, to convert this into counts, let's say for exposure time of one second, and I'm gonna silently type down what happens, and then we can discuss why it is so. And of course, you can look at the screen that is shared at any time and, and see what, what happens here. So let's all take five minutes to try to do this on, on our own. Okay, so roughly three or, three or four minutes have passed. So I, I will give you a few more minutes and I'll just do the conversion and, and go off the things. Okay, let's discuss this very briefly. So I want you to pay attention to this number 17 here. Okay, I'm, I'm actually gonna 
now highlighting makes it worse. So, since the, the easiest way to think about this is to say, and this actually gives you very, very reasonable numbers. The easiest way to think about this is to say, I'm looking, the intensity is energy per unit surface, per unit solid, solid angle, per unit wavelength, per unit time. To get the counts, I need to get the actual energy and to divide it with energy of one photon. That makes sense, right? To get the actual energy, I should take my specific intensity, multiply it by the surface of the pixel on the sun, so basically of the total surface that contributes to the intensity, multiply it with the solid angle. Which solid angle? Well, the sol this is now a bit counterintuitive. The solid angle the light is emitted into, and that solid angle is basically the solid angle determined by the size of your telescope and the distance to the sun. So it's basically the solid angle that your telescope spans as seen by the sun. Okay? We multiply it by the time that we can arbitrarily choose, but we will see later that time matters. Actually, you have heard from Valentin before the time matters, but today we will understand some other things why time matters. And finally, we multiply it with the delta pin, with the lambda pin, which is basically how, 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 well, it's literally how big our chunk of the wavelength is. And here I'm doing exactly that. The radius of my telescope is four times 10 to the two centimeters, and I need to do everything in SI, right? Because my intensity is given, uh, sorry, I need to do everything in CGS because my intensity is given in CGS. This is exposure in centimeters. This is the lambda beam that I simply estimated from the array that is given to me. This is distance to the, to the sun. And here you see that this is basically the, the biggest number, right? This is, like, like no matter how big your telescope is and so on, it's still it's still super small solid angle because you're so far away from the sun. Uh, then there is the pixel size a, which is twenty kilometers, which is twenty times e to the five centimeter. Uh, pi I just denoted it this way because we'll need it in pi to few situations. This delta e is the energy of one photon. I don't have to be worried about the fact that my wavelength is changing because, as I said, usually in the solar observations, with all these instruments, we usually focus on very small wavelength intervals. So I can say roughly the energy of my uh, the energy of my uh, 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 photon is corresponds to the wavelength of six six thousand three hundred uh, three hundred angstroms. And then my conversion factor is what? Well. It's the surface, which is the square of the size of the pixel, multiplied by the angle, which is in this case radius of the telescope squared times pi, divided by distance squared, then multiplied by the wavelength beam, okay, multiplied by the time, but time is one, and finally divided by the energy of the photon. Okay, you execute this beam, you get the conversion rate, which is this, 1.41 times 10 to the minus seven. And then when we multiply the whole Stokes cube with this conversion factor, and we do, we plot the things, you will see that, okay, now the now this conversion has been done a few times, so we need to run everything from the start. Okay, I really hate, I really hate these things sometimes. So what are we gonna do here now? Is we're gonna say counts. No. We're gonna call the original one Stokes zero. And I'm gonna call this one Stokes. Here we're going to plot all the stokes zero. So let's execute everything from the very beginning. Okay, very good. So now take a look at the numbers here at this plot. Okay, and the easiest is just to look at the at the spectrum. You have three, roughly three times ten to the seven counts. So in the ideal case, if nothing was lost in your instrument, and if you use, let's say, spectrograph, which has the beam of this 
uh, actually we didn't print it out, but I can tell you that it's roughly uh, that it's roughly 20 milliamps from the wavelength beam. And you exposed for one second, you would detect three times 10 to the seven counts. Of course, you couldn't do this in one exposure because no camera can record three times 10 to the seven counts. You would have to do a lot of smaller exposures and then stack them. But in principle, for one second, this is how many photons enter your instrument in the ideal case. We will see that this is going to be much smaller because what we actually do is we have a lot of things that are lost in our in our optical path between our primary and and our detector in the end. So to, so to really get realistic numbers, we're going to multiply this by 0 0.1 or maybe even much less. Okay, and we talked about some of these reasons, right? We said, that, for example, one reason is that in spectrograph, not all the light goes in one order. We have multiple orders, so some light is lost, etc., etc. You have a lot of unwanted absorptions and and similar things. This is the number of photons emitted per pixel of the simulations, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is in spatial result simulations. Of course, what we could do is we could pin pixels here and then our signal would increase a lot. And just to reiterate one very important point is that if we decrease our telescope, then it wouldn't make sense to have such a small pixels. Okay? So if we de de decrease our telescope two times, our resolving power would decrease two times our angle would be bigger, then we would have to use bigger pixels. And this is what Valentin and, and I was also telling you, and Kevin was telling you, that in principle, the size of the telescope is completely offset by the size of the pixel. The bigger telescope it, it is, the smaller pixels you get to use. When I say smaller pixels, I don't literally mean smaller pixels in the camera. I mean the pixels on your camera correspond to smaller chunks on the sun. Okay, cool. And another thing that I want you to, to notice is that the counts that correspond to Stokes parameters are very, very small. And the easiest way to see this is to actually replot this normalized with respect to the, to the first component. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to leave the first component as it is, but I'm going to divide the remaining three with the first component. So basically what we will see here is the degree of, of polarization. And you see that these numbers are very small. So in Stokes V, we have a roughly 4% polarization. In Stokes Q and U, we have much, much lower degrees of polarization. Okay, Cassandra, you asked me in the email, what is the, basically you asked me what is the reason for this and how we measure magnetic fields from this. We will go much more into these details, but this is because of the Zeman effect. And Zeman effect is much more sensitive uh, to the line of sight magnetic field. Simply line of sight magnetic field linearly influences the circular polarization, while transversal magnetic field quadratically influences the, uh, the linear polarization, but the coefficient is very, very, very small. So for relatively weak magnetic fields, you basically don't see linear polarization at all. And we will see in a bit when we model the noise, our Stokes profiles are going to be, our linear Stokes profiles are going to be eaten by noise completely. Okay? Cool. Let's finally go to the modulation. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm going to write a small function that encodes this thing here, right? So what this, what this function gonna do is it's gonna take the values of theta and delta, okay? And it's gonna return these coefficients which stand in front of i, q, u, and v. Okay, so let's do that now. Let's define a function, uh, and I usually call it uh, modulation row because this is one, one modulation row, right? And the function takes as an argument theta and delta, theta, I guess, is the pronunciation. And then let's see what we get here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to say there is a row which is an array of size four, and I'm going to ignore this one half in front, and I'm going to say something like this. Uh, so, so let's see what we have here. Row one is obviously one. Row two is cosine two theta. 
rho 3 is cosine delta sine 2 theta and then sine delta sine 2 theta. So let's try and, and do this bit right again. So cosine 2 times theta, rho 2 is mp cosine delta times mp sine um, 2 theta and rho 3 is mp sine delta times mp sine. If you see me make some mistake, warn me. And then since I want to stack these rows, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reshape it in the end. Um, and I'm going to give it this shape, 1, 4. And this will make it easier for me to stack the rows using mp concatenate. I guess is the is the name. So let's check what this what this does. So let's print modulation row zero zero for example. I know we need to return, right? Why didn't you why didn't you correct me? Okay, and it's one one zero zero. Does it make sense? Well it does because if theta is zero, cosine is one, etc. etc. So basically I'm measuring i plus q. Okay. So, again, let's take a few minutes and try to come up with your own modulation scheme, which only uses four measurements to calculate IQ, U, and V. Okay, so trying to use four values for four combinations of theta and delta. Obviously, one can be zero, zero, right? And to help you with the idea, one way to calculate I and Q on its own would be to use zero, zero to get this i plus q and then zero and then uh, 90 degrees and zero so you would have the cosine of 180 which is minus one so you will get one minus one and that way you're measuring combination of one plus q and one minus q you have two measurements two unknowns you can get you can get i plus q and in the meantime i will code i will code the rest So, for those of you who are curious to see the answer, one combination that I found was to... So, what, what would be an ideal thing to do? Let's, so, so, people who don't want to listen to this, try to ignore me and to code your own. So, I showed you sort of the idea how to measure I plus Q and I minus Q. So, once we know I and Q, what we can do is we can, for example, measure I plus U and i plus v, and since we know i, we just measure uh, u and v directly from these two equations, right? Does that make sense? And it's relatively simple because if I if I have theta, theta now set to pi quarter, 
sin, uh, this goes to zero, sine to theta goes to one, here and here, and then I just have to have delta, which is in one case zero, so I get one here and zero next to V, and then I set it to pi hal, so I get zero next to U and one next to V. And that is exactly what I did in this next piece of code here. So try to look at this, at this, ma at this matrix here. So the first row is one, one. It's measuring I plus Q. The second row is, why the second row again, one, one? It doesn't make sense. Did I, ah, because I rotated the meaning of theta and delta, okay? Sorry about that. We will start that. Zero, zero. Huh. Okay. So first row is one, one. Okay. Uh, I will actually do it here. So I'm measuring I plus Q. Second one is I minus, I minus one. 1 minus 1, so I'm measuring i minus q. From these two, I get i and q. So now i is known. Then I get uh, 1, 0, 1, 0. So i plus u, I can get the u directly. And finally, it's 1, 0, 0, 1. So it's i plus v, I get the v directly. Of course, we're not going to do this step by step like this. We're going to just invert the matrix. So let's now try and modulate our signal. What does that mean? It means the following. I'm going to extract the Stokes, the Stokes vector for this, one, uh, for this one pixel that we get here. I'm going to call it I original, and it's going to be Stokes X coordinate, Y coordinate, and its shape. Okay, I'm still living in the past. Its shape is 4 times 131. So I only accepted one profile, and we're now going to focus on this one profile here. Okay. So I don't need this anymore. Let's modulate it. How are we going to modulate? Well, we're going to make a one variable here that keeps the length of the valence, and we're going to say for L in range 0 to L. So for each valence, I calculate my my. Uh, my observable and now I'm going to make a vector of observables which are just intensities and it is a little counterintuitive because you would like to call Stokes vector S and intensities I but since in Valentin's lecture Stokes vector was I and measured quantities were S I'm going to call this array of measurements which are actually measured intensities for various modulation states I'm going to call it S measured to stress that it's like that and it's if dimension is going to be what? Well, it's going to be 4 for 4 modulation states and 131 for all the valence, right? When we change the number of modulation states, the number of these dimensions here is going to change. And then my S measured is going to be what? It's going to be the dot product between the modulation matrix and the original intensity at uh, at that wavelength, right? So I also want to specify the wavelength here. And this should now work. Of course, it doesn't. You have to put the nail ahead of the S. Yeah. Exactly. You? Okay, that works. Cool. Uh, so in principle, we could now look at these measure, measured quantities. That, can anybody tell me what are they going to look like? What would you bet that they're going to look like? First was i plus q, and the second would be i minus q. Right, and i plus u and i minus, and i plus v. So, but what are they going to look like? Like to your eye? Normal profile. Like a normal profile of the intensity, right? I can, I can plot them now, but... but Trust me, you can do it on your own on your own later. I want to move a little bit faster because we still have a lot of ground to cover. But in principle, when you, uh, since you are always measuring some linear combinations between I, Q, U, and V, right? As you can see from this matrix here. And I is so much bigger than Q, U, and V, it's 
everything is going to look like intensity to you on the camera. So this is why people always say that polarimetry is differential photometry. So you measure one intensity, you measure some slightly different intensity, you subtract them, and this difference is your polarized signal. So now what are we going to do is we're going to do something super simple. We're just going to go and demodulate and demodulate this. And, and this is going to be super simple. Why? Because I'm going to say I, uh, let's say inferred, is zeros four and L and then again I'm going to go through all the valence and I need to demodulate. To demodulate what do I need to do? I need to multiply the measurement with the inverse of the matrix, right? So let's call O4 inverse is going to be MP. You have this linal which is a sub package of the numpy which is great which has all the linear algebra things that, that you will need. Invert of O4 as measured, blah, blah, blah. And so what do I want to do? I now want to calculate my, this is gonna be n dot between what? Well, the inverted one, and as measured, one valent at a time, and here we have one valent at a time, and after that, I'm gonna plot this i Actually, yeah, I'll code this again because now I want the, the real quantities again. So let's say <coughs> sorry about that. Let's say something like this, and then what do I want here? I want I inferred zero. And then here I want the, the other ones. One. I have an extra bracket. I do. Thank you. And this thing. And now, of course, since everything is super beautiful, if this works properly, I'm going to get exactly the thing that I put in here. Okay? Things are completely the same. Well, the reason for this is because there is literally nothing bad happening here. I know my matrix perfectly, I invert it perfectly, and things are super good. But in practice, we don't know our matrix perfectly. One of the reasons for that is because maybe you measure it at some point, and then these things change as the sun is traveling through the sky and the temperature is changing and a lot of things are unstable and so on and so on. Simply your instrument is not completely stable. So what are we going to do now is we're going to simulate something called crosstalk. Okay. So let's just write a small comment here that the things work by now. So wow, we managed to get back all our uh, our original signal. Great. There are now a few other things that I want you to, to think about now. I want to show you what the crosstalk is and we'll do that, but before that let's actually talk about something else. So I have now shown you a modulation scheme which has four different measurements to infer four stocks parameters. However, if you remember Valentin's talk and he told you a lot of things, he told you most importantly, maybe, that none of the modulation schemes that we actually use are these ones. We use either the modulation scheme with six parameters, with six measurements, or we use a modulation scheme with four measurements, but completely different than this one. It's the one with basically fixed, fixed polar, uh, polarizer orientation and then rotating, a rotating wave plane. Does anybody know why? Why don't we use this one? So we came up with this here in class. It's very easy. It works. It gives us back the stocks profiles. Why don't we use it? Because of something called efficiency. So there are these things that Valentin was talking about, which are the so-called polarimetric efficiencies. And these basically polarimetric efficiencies, we're going to operationally see why they are different now. These polarimetric efficiencies are uh, measurements where uh, are 
are numbers that tell you basically how much of the signal you are using for each stokes parameter. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna make another scheme with six measurements, we're gonna normalize them so that the total number of photons they, they measure is the same. We're gonna introduce some noise in our system and we're gonna see whether the number of noise in the Stokes profiles is different, okay? So let's do it slowly. Let's first code, yes, sir. Why did you choose the six uh, state uh, example and not the four? Uh, it, the four was a bit complicated because we actually had to write Mueller matrices. So I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to use this this simple equation that we saw here, which is very which is very straightforward. So we will just add two more two more equations here. So we will measure i plus u i minus q i plus u i minus u i plus v i minus v, and then we will say what is going on here. But before that, let's introduce some noise in our measure. So the easiest way to do that is to, and first I'm gonna separate these things in, in two arrays. Actually, no, it, this can stay like this. Let's just copy all this into a new signal, into a new signal, into a new, new field. Let's, let's add some noise now. So I can repeat this, this is not a problem. I don't need an L anymore. And now what are we gonna do is we're gonna add some random perturbations to our measured quantities, right? The way to do that is, we don't have too much time to talk about this now, but the easiest way to do add random perturbations, due simply the finite number of photons, is to add uh, a random number from a normal distribution with the width equal to the square root of the total count. Okay, so the way to do it would be something like this. I'm gonna go through all the valence, calculate the square root of this measured S. What is this measured S? These are again counts, right? We are working in counts all the time. So I literally can't just take square root of this. So let's add some Gaussian noise. noise. So for um, <coughs> M in range zero four, for L in range zero and L, S measure of ML, I'm gonna increase it by what? By a random number, uh, and you, you can use function NP random random N, and it will give you a random number from Gaussian distribution centered or zero with width one, and then to scale it, I just multiply it with the square root of the actual number of counts. Okay? Right. Everything else stays the same. Let's hope that this now works. Of course it doesn't. NumPy random has no attribute to random normal. You, you misspelled it. No, I think it's yep. mp.random.normal. Or random. Oh, okay. This? Amazing. Thank you, Bennett. Look at this. Stokes, Q, and U have completely disappeared because, because of the noise. But they were not the other. They were very low. Thousands. Yeah, yeah, if we go back, we can see that they were very, very, very weak. So they were less than, so here they were less to 10 to the minus three. Yeah. Okay? But they, so, so obviously we, with this setup like this, in one second, you can't do polarimetry at this spectral resolution with 10 to the minus three. The thing would be even worse if we now further multiply this measured number with appropriate throughputs and so on and so on. Things would be much, 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 much worse. Okay, pretty cool. So let's leave this like this, and actually what I want to do here is I want to save this array, so I'm gonna call this I inferred four in order to make sure to remember that it's created by the four, four states of modulation. And now let's write the modulation scheme for six states of modulation. Okay, so I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna use the same matrix as here. I'm just gonna add two more rows. So I'm gonna call it O six, O six. 
six. And now what I do here is I have another one, which is a three pi over four, right? And this is, let's write this all the way and then I, I, will, I will basically tell you what is going on. And here I'm dating three i over four and I'm printing it and we need to change this to four six, four six, four six, four six, four six. Print and look at this. One, one, zero, zero. One minus one, zero, zero. One, zero, one, zero. One, zero, minus one, zero. One, zero, zero, one. One, zero, zero, minus one. And this corresponds to this scheme here of operational scheme of the Stokes parameters, right? So we have I. I is the sum of any two, right? Q is two orthogonal, like this. U is difference between two orthogonal, like this. Stokes V is difference between two orthogonal, like this. Okay, so now uh, we need to modulate and demodulate using this, this quantity here. Um, we're going to do everything the same as in the previous case, except we have to take care that we are now changing the modulation scheme. So I original is the same, Stokes measured, I'm going to call it Stokes measured six now. It will have dimension six because we are doing six measurements. So Stokes measured six is mp.06 I original. We are adding again some Gaussian noise, which is this here and I have I inferred six which still has dimension four because it's just a Stokes vector and now we need to use different routine to invert this right so you can't invert the rectangular matrix this matrix now has dimension six times four and for this you know to do to use this Penrose Moore pseudo inverse and luckily the only thing that we need to do in our code is just add P here and Python calculates the pseudo inverse for you. And then we have I6 inferred like this. O4 inverse, be very careful. I made many mistakes today changing these numbers. <clears throat> and then we need to change this, etc. And we execute this thing. It looks again, quiet noise. But now we would like some way to compare the noise between two things. So one way that I can do, obviously, to compare the noise, well, we could try and compare, we could just try and float two of these things that look like pure noise next to each other. So let's just, for example, calculate, compare two stokes U's next to each other. So in this one, I'm going to plot LL I inferred four two and I inferred uh, six two. Okay, I forgot one thing, which is important. Uh, but okay, let's plot this and then and then discuss. So you can see, and I will add legend so that we. So this is four states. Uh, no, it's not legend, it's label. And this is label equal six states. And then I actually need to tell it to plot the legend. So, like if I asked you to bet which one has smaller noise, you would say orange, but we can't really see that, right? And there is, in addition to make things work, I forgot one thing. In a way, my total number of photons is bigger here because I did six measurements. So to be completely fair, I'm going to scale these by four over six to compensate for basically different exposures that I should use, right? If I hear here, so now there is no dual beam, there are no things like this, I only have four different polarization states. To do four modulations, and here's six modulations, in total they should take the same time, right? So let's, to be completely fair, let's measure, let's normalize this by that. Okay. 
and everything else is the same. Okay. So you can't really tell, right? I mean, actually you can tell because the noise here is, is now a little bit smaller, okay? If now in this case, you sort of see that. But the easiest way to really see this is to do the following. To subtract the original and calculate the standard deviation, okay? This would be the best way to actually see what our noise is because in this case, we are working with the, with the observations that we have uh, generated, so we can, we can do that. So I'm gonna do it in the same cell just to be consistent. So let's do MP, so print, MP SDD, I inferred four two minus I original two. And here I'm gonna do the same for six. Uh, and then I can normalize them with, re with respect to something. Uh, let's normalize them. Actually, let's, let's maybe do it like this. This is, it's easier to just put it in the, to normalize it with respect to the signals. Uh, divide with I original zero. So I'm sort of comparing fractional polarizations, that is, which is not completely maybe mathematically bounded, but it, Gives tells us something. And look at the numbers. They are not exactly the same. They are far from the same. So the second number is small. Factor of two, yeah, which looks a bit high to be completely honest. So what we did is we changed the, the modulation scheme. So we changed the modulation scheme. We got back our proper Stokes vector. That's not the problem. Look at this like this. Okay, these numbers are differ a little bit more than what I would expect, but they should differ. And the reason for that is, and we can formally show that, is we can actually calculate polarimetric efficiencies, which is what Valentin was, was talking to us last time. And the way to do that is you just sum your basically polarimetric efficiency. There should be equation in his in his presentation, but it's the uh, square root of. Okay, I have to take a look at my at my other one. to take a look at this equation here to get the efficiencies, 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 efficiencies are here. Okay, let's go back to the to the presentation and see find the expression for polarimetric efficiency. So this is Valentin's talk. We need to go a bit down the further. Okay, so you may be, so this is what we did. Okay, oh, 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 sorry. This is what we did, right? This was our scheme. Why does it change? This is our scheme here. And 
Now we're going to go down and do C expression for calculating these. There is a lot of molar matrices that we avoided on purpose, right? Oh, come on. Okay, so this is the modulation, modulation, efficiency. Okay, here it is. Error propagation gives noise, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it's one. So it's one over square root of n times sum of each individual row of D, which is the demodulation matrix. Okay, cool. So let's put that in our code. So uh, calculating uh, efficiency. So it's going to be, uh, we're going to print what? One over square root of n, for the first one is four modulation states, times mp sum of the rows of the inverse matrix. So it was, the inverse matrix was called O4 in by hope. In, but I'm said I'm only summing each row, so we are summing over the second axis, right? It should be something like this. See what this returns? That's something bad. Okay, let's you have to you have to square it. I have to square it. Thank you. And now the same for the O six and look at the numbers here. So the second one might be very familiar to you. The second one are these ideal polarimetric efficiencies that you can achieve. So it's one for Stokes I, one over square root of three for all the other Stokes parameters. For the in the previous case, we got something much much worse. So we get 0 0.7 for Stokes I, and then basically square root of two worse for the other two polarization states. Okay? And I'm actually not 100% sure why this is like that. So we should probably ask somebody who's, a, who's an expert to explain us what hides behind this. Obviously, you see that efficiency in the first case is better for IQ because we measured I plus Q and I minus Q, and then the other things we measured basically from one measurement, from one measurement each. But this sort of justifies what is, what is going on. I can't really tell you now what I did here to get such a big difference between these two noises. If you go to another one that I shared with you or on the GitHub link, you will see that the difference between the noise for two different modulations really corresponds to the difference between these, these numbers here. Okay? Okay, cool. Well, it's 3 or 5 already. Uh, we can discuss this afterward, but let's complete this by talking about the crosstalk and figuring out what the crosstalk is, and then we can, we can see what happens there. So for the crosstalk, I'm gonna, let's use the, let's use the whichever one, whichever scheme, we can use the, again, the, Let's be realistic, so let's use, use the scheme with six, with six measurements, but we're just not going to apply any noise, but we're instead going to do something else here. So, <coughs> I'm going to, again, calculate these uh, measured quantities, but now I'm not going to apply any noise. Uh -huh. Okay, I see where the difference came from. The difference came from because I, sh I normalized the measurements by something, but then I should have also scaled back my Stokes I by that because I sort of decreased my exposure in a way. 
Okay, we can elaborate on this on this thing thing later. Let's not go to that. Let's talk about uh, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, what the crosstalk is. So now, if we if we do the same thing that we did before, so we modulate, we demodulate. So this is here modulation this here I'm going to delete demodulation demodulation if you do that you're going to get exactly the spectrum that you put in right super beautiful spectrum everything clear and so on but the thing is that the modulation matrix will change with time with wavelength with that right so what are we going to do now is we're going to mess up our original matrix a little bit. So I'm going to call it 06 wrong and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to multiply each each element with some small random number. Okay? It's first I'm going to just copy the or, or or we can do it like this. So it is 06 times mp random rent and right zero uh, so it's going to generate a random number i know but i want for each one then let's generate 24 random numbers and reshape them as for six and then scale that with one percent all okay so this is a very small thingy and of course if i since i'm multiplying i need to add one in front so now let's to print both of these matrices. So first I'm going to print 06. 06, 06. And then we print 06 wrong. And here they are. So this is the ideal one here. Only there are all these 10 to the minus 17, which are numerical. But now you see the wrong one, which is a little bit messed up, right? So you see some things that are that are happening here. I just multiply. Probably multiplying is the wrong thing to do because this matrix has to preserve some properties. But to illustrate the point, this is the simplest thing that, that we can do. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna invert using the using the same the same thing. And when I do that, okay, well, I need to I also need to when I'm modulating i need to modulate with the wrong one right so wrong one why are we modulating with the wrong one we're not doing this on purpose we're just simulating the fact that we don't know what the actual modulation matrix is we think that it's something but it's actually something else and now when i run this you will see that what i get is completely weird right so now my stokes u and q look exactly like stokes i Stokes V looks like Stokes V for the moment, but if you look more carefully, you will see that the continuum level is shifted, right? And the best way now to, to illustrate this is to sub subtract the original ones. So now I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna subtract the original ones. So let's do the, the I original. Minus I original zero. And then, then you see the difference. Okay, uh, yeah. Then you see that there is some some crosstalk here. Okay, I don't have to do this for stock side because it's usually very very small. But now you see that there is that the biggest part of IQU of actually QU and V is the Stokes I. And this is the simplest possible cross talk that actually you could remove post, post, in post processing. But also after, if we were now to remove this one, there would be leftover of the other ones. So we would get the, the, the cross talk between Q, uh, between uh, from V to Q and, and U and so on and so on. And you can try to simulate that by, for example, just perturbing uh, 
lower lower part. So skip first row and first column. Don't do anything to that one, but just return the other elements, and you will get the other the other crosstalks. And finally, the last one that I want to see, and this is something that I just illustratively got, but is very important to illustrate. I think is something which is called seeing induced crosstalk. So the reason for this crosstalk here is that we don't know the, the modulation matrix. Actually, we think that we know modulation matrix, but we don't know it. This was this, this crosstalk here. This, uh, I don't know how we call it. We just call it crosstalk. But there is a specific kind of crosstalk which comes not from the fact that our demodulation is bad, but comes from the fact that actually the intensity that in enters our modulation changes. Right? The image shifts or distorts, and I'm not using the same image for each of the six measurements. So now we're going to try and, and do that. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to extract an image. I'm going to do it by just focusing on one valence. So now we don't have to look things at the valence. We're going to look at the, at the spatial distribution. I'm going to take it as Stokes at, uh, at one valence only, and I'm going to plot that. So plot. Yeah, I'm actually going to just copy the part from the from the other one because we are now we are now running running out of time a little bit. So we're going to do this. Just going to plot the original one, and it looks like like this. Okay. So there are some very very small numbers here. Okay. And and you can see that these numbers are very small knowing that the, that the magnitude of the first image here is 10 to the 7. And here there are some tens, hundreds, even thousands. So completely negligible, OK? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm somehow going to try and simulate what happens with my image here. And to do that, I'm going to use this function row. So. Okay, what happens now is the following situation. So, uh, we're going to still have the, the nice original one. So, I original is the intensity where I only selected that at one wavelength. Now, uh, my measurements are, are basically images at six different modulation states, and I'm inferring back some intensity, which is Stokes parameters at, at four for intensities. And now I'm going to make four, five different arrays, which is just original intensity, shifted a little bit. First one by one pixel in X and Y, second one by two, third one by three, fourth one by four, fifth one by five. And then what happens now is that what I'm measuring is the following thing. At each of these modulation states is I'm gonna measure uh, what I'm measuring is so I J zero is gonna be the, the dot product between my my modulation matrix at zero times my intensity, uh, okay, so let's do, let's be completely consistent and have one more, which is shifted by six. So I can just do this. I, one, I, G. Okay. I know I also need the, the modulation thing. It should be okay. Should be something like this. So what am I doing here? Huh? Come, come. Yeah. What's the question? It was an echo. I was just an echo. Okay. So what I'm measuring here is in one modulation state, I'm multiplying the appropriate row of my modulation matrix with my intensity in one moment of time. And now these one, two, three, four, five, six simulate in a very naive way how my image is is uh, is changing with these you know, in these different moments of time. So I'm just gonna do this six times. So we have one, two, three, 
four five um, one two three four five and here we have two three four five six okay and then we know that our we know our modul demodulation matrix and modulation matrix perfectly, but we don't know we don't know that the image has has moved in the meantime. So what I have to do now is now I have to demodulate it, and I can modulate everything at the at the same time. Okay, it's going to be something like this. Okay, I just multiply the inverse. With the, with the measure thingy here, and then hopefully, okay, hopefully we can plot things and something is gonna, something's gonna be correct. Okay, it doesn't work. Missing one required positional argument. Ah, of course, this is, this should be commas, not stars. This work. Hooray! Okay, so what you see here is something that doesn't look at all like the Stokes parameters that you have seen before. And actually, the magnitude here is really, really big. It's a big part of the stoke size. So remember what was stoke size? It was three times ten to the seven. Now this is order of one times ten to the seven. Probably we shifted the image too much, or or we should scale things somehow. But basically, what you see, these images look like derivative, like spatial derivative of stoke size. And this is why we were very often here that so-called seeing-induced polarization looks like the spatial derivative of the stoke side because your image is changing and actually our stoke side is a little bit blurred. You can see it on your screens because our image was changing and we sort of averaged what was happening there, right? So this way, in a very naive way, we simulated what was happening. So we are, we are basically running out of time and so I'm really quickly gonna summarize what we did. We basically wrote very simple schemes which simulate how the modulation and demodulation works. Then we have seen how the noise propagates through the demodulation and modulation, which determines your precision. And precision is related to polarimetric efficiencies. Then we simulated what happens when we don't know the um, uh, modulation matrix very well, which basically offsets and changes the shape of our Stokes parameters, which is related in a way with accuracy. And finally, we have seen what happens when our image changes while we modulate, and we have seen what is the seeing-induced polarization. And this correlates very well to the things that Valentin and Francisco were telling you this week and the last week about why we need very fast modulation, why we need image restoration, why we need short exposure times, and so on and so on. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, I won't force you too much. This was just a demo in real life. Here on top of this, you have the Mueller matrix of the telescope. All this modulation, the modulation matrices depend, strictly speaking, on the wavelength, and some people even say with the, with the field of view. So for different pixels, you could have different modulation matrices, and so on and so on. So things can be, if you really want to be precise and picky, things can be very complicated. Okay, keep this in mind. See you on Thursday and text for 10. And take, take your time to take a look at this and ask me any questions you might have. For the homework, you will have to code the proper modulation and demodulation with the rotating wave plate, which means you will use some Miller matrices. Thank you so much and see you soon. No questions from online? We can do it on Thursday. Okay. <laughs>